kitchen. Right, well, good morning everybody. We're here to talk about the collapse of bearings, an important event in financial history which occurred on the 26th of February, 1995. Bearings was the oldest investment bank in the United Kingdom, having been founded in 1792. It almost went broke in 1890 when it was actually rescued by a bank called Rothschilds, which I also worked for. But it did, was officially put under administration of the High Court on February the 26th, 1995. And I'm sit sitting opposite the man responsible for this important event in financial history. As I worked for Bering for almost exactly the same time as he did between 1990 and 95, I think that his presence in Mexico is a very interesting opportunity for us all to learn various things from him about this event. First about what happened, what happened to him, to his colleagues and to the institution in 1995 and why it happened, specifically the human side. Then there's the historical side, which is that, unsurprisingly, this event actually was a huge uh, event in the United Kingdom and the rest of the world, in the financial system. And there have been various books written about this event. Here, one called All That Glitters by John Gapper and Nicholas. Another called The Collapse of Bearings by Stephen Fay. Another called Going for Broke by Judith Ronsley. Another by Nicholas himself called Rogue, Rogue Trader. There was also, by the way, a movie about the event with uh, Ewan McGregor and, and Anna Friel. And finally, there's a report by the um, made for the House of Commons by the Board of Banking Supervision. So, I think a lot of people probably haven't even heard of this event, but I think it was important ending the, um, the last century. And so the way I'd like to um, develop uh, this um, conversation is, is to precisely get his version of what happened to him. What happened to his colleagues, of which I was one, even though I was in Mexico and he was in Singapore. In fact, one of my most recent definitions of globalization is globalization is when a gentleman from Watford is working in Singapore trading Japanese derivatives and affects, for an English bank, and affects my life in Mexico. So that's the definition of globalization. So the first thing would be to find out what is, but then his view of what other people think about what happened. He, we, he, I know he has an answer to that, but um, he will have seen the movie. And, but his view of what he thinks other people think about. And then um, what he thinks has been the effect on finance, on financial institutions, and on the financial system. And finally, I'd like to throw it open to him to find out whether he wants to ask me questions as an ex-colleague, what he thinks, I, uh, what happened to all of us at this event, and so on. Because he was, I know, he went to Malaya and then he was was a, a arrested in Frankfurt and all those stories, but exactly what he thinks was going on in the rest of the world. But all this, but I think it's an, in, I, I, I've been curious about this this event ever since it happened 22 years ago. So this is a unique opportunity for me to learn and I hope other people will learn as well from what Nicholas has to tell us. So Nicholas, uh, I'd like to begin by asking you what happened and why it happened. Um, well, I, I started work at a, at a similar time uh, or a similar year to you, Timothy. It was 1990 that I started working for Bearings in Port Soken Street, Bearings Securities specifically in Port Soken Street in London, um, looking after Japanese futures and options originally. And then I, um, I was offered the opportunity to go out to Hong Kong to work for a while, then Indonesia. I came back to London for a short period, worked in business development, and then was asked to go and look at the futures and options 
trading floor in Singapore. Um, and I suppose everything up until that point had been very good and I'd been very successful. Uh, and then when I arrived in Singapore, I encountered a lot of things that I hadn't experienced before. I didn't cope with them particularly well. I was 25 years of age and I made lots of silly mistakes. And over a period of time, um, that evolved into unchecked risk taking. Um, and I assumed or I built a position in Japanese futures and options that nobody at the bank knew about. Um, but was risking many, many times the capital base of the bank. Unknowingly, I, I didn't realize that the capital base of the bank was so small at the time. Um, and the money, every time I asked for more money, it kept coming out to me in Singapore. Obviously, everybody was believing the profits that we were re reporting, uh, which were quite, uh, quite, quite large. Um, and nobody was investigating any further. That Everybody was, was believing what they were being told. But if I may, you you were um, were you really making money, or you weren't making money? At the beginning, there was a little bit of money that was being made, but over the period, uh, I would say ninety five percent of the time, we were loss making. But you were supposed to be trading for clients. Yeah, that's what I understood. You were supposed to do agency business, thinking in terms of finance. How did you end up trading for the bank? Well, there were, I, I suppose there were two reasons that, that it occurred. You're right, when I first arrived in Singapore, the purpose was to be an, an, an agency broker. So the clients would have been other offices of Barron's was where there was proprietary trading, and there would have been clients as well. So typically, the Japanese trading desk was in, uh, in Tokyo, and then there would be a couple of uh, specialist Japanese um, uh, futures and options staff who were based in London. One of those was a lady called Sue Koo, who used to run the Japanese options trading book. So, uh, out of Tokyo. No, no, she was well, she was in London for a good bit as well. So she mixed her time between London and uh, and uh, and Tokyo. Um, and so there were trading book. There were a couple of trading books in London, uh, but the majority of them, the ar the big arbitrage books that existed, were based out of Tokyo. So they were our customers. And then there were opportunities, I suppose, the, the way that it evolved, obviously it was originally agency stuff. I had some errors that had occurred on the trading floor. I was hiding what those. You, you bought instead of sold. And yeah, sold. yeah. I mean, the I, usual I, stuff. Us, the well, usual you, stuff. This actually has happened to me in the Mexican group. You say you should, somebody, when they sell it, that's kind of a bit embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the, I mean, obviously you have to make the customer good. So what happened in Singapore at the time was the Nikkei 225 was, um, was trading uh, big contracts in, in Japan. Um, very little trade was coming through Singapore. And then there was an explosion of business because they introduced circuit breakers into the Japanese markets. So the market started to fall from a high of 40,000 all the way down to 18,000. So there would often be days when you came into the market in Singapore, or you, came, you looked at the market in Japan, and You're talking 40,091, uh, and then 91, 92. the Japanese thing, and then you got the Kobe earthquake. When was that was that? much, so that was towards the end, in, right. in 95. But the market was falling from 39,000 all the way down towards 20. So the circuit breakers were coming into Japan, so there, were, there was a pause on the trading. And then there would be a mass of sell orders that would just build up behind it. So there were days in, in, in that particular period where no trading were, or no futures trading would be done in Japan. You could still trade equities, um, but there were no, there, there was no futures trading. So everybody was switching their business to Singapore. So Singapore, uh, why? Because they because they couldn't trade in break. Japan. There were no circuit breakers. Okay. It's a live, open outcry it's market. Like an offshore. Okay. Well, it was an, yeah, it, it was a parody. Like, we, like in Mexico, we have ADRs. You know, we have more okay. trading in New York. Yes, yeah. stocks we do. Yeah. So, so the market, the the, 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 the two markets were exactly See, the, the same. The market developed, and so. Well, it theoretically profited. Well, it, I mean, it exploded. The market just didn't develop, it exploded. It went from nothing to all of the business from straight away. In the, yeah, in the 92, 93 period. Now the, and the way that it worked is that the market was falling quite aggressively, and the maximum move I think you could have in the Nikkei 225 right, but the on one day was 700. If I may interrupt you, because I want to hear your version. You, were move, you went and cleaned up the back office. That was yeah. in Indonesia. Right, but my general view is that you were very, very good at back office stuff. Yeah. You were then put in charge of the operations in the book. 
yeah. and you're put into the front office as a trader. What did you know about trading? Nothing. No, so um, to totally unqualified for the role. Um, didn't, you, I was, didn't you? How come you took the job? Because it was just higher I, salary. Uh, you thought you no, no, I, I went. I went to Singapore for a reduction in salary um, because Simon Jones, who was in charge of the office, didn't want to pay what I was being paid in the UK. So I actually took a cut, and I wasn't. I, I wasn't on a great expat. What package. were you being paid? Uh, I'm not there. You can't uh, tell me. No, no, no. It's not that I can't tell you. I can't. I can't honestly remember the, the number. The, the figure that comes to mind is about six thousand Singapore dollars a month, and I don't know I have why. No idea what that was. It's not a lot. It's about. It would have been about three thousand pounds a you month. Had a so bonus, according to this, we were talking about two hundred fifty thousand pounds. That's group. yeah. Uh, at the end of the so you third had the year. So wrong incentives. Okay, Absolutely. It was. Uh, I mean, the incentives at bearings, and I don't know how this was in Mexico. But the bonuses were the thing that lured everything. Absolutely. So it wasn't unheard of. And I think the year that you're talking about, um, we're talking about something like three times salary that I was being paid. Even when I worked in the back office in London, you would get a year's salary. You didn't, feel that way. you didn't think, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. And you didn't say, hey, we should get, so you didn't, that didn't occur to you. No, look, I was 25. I. I'd succeeded at everything that I'd done till that point. I didn't think there was anything that I couldn't cope with. And, you know, you look back and I'm 50 years of age now, you know, and, and you try to characterize what went on during that period. You know, I reached my level of incompetence when I was in Singapore. Thinking about the characterization of you by Ewan McGregor, yeah. you had the famous mooning incident. Yeah. That's all true. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, I mean, he was a cocky guy. That, he, did you meet him? No, no, and I haven't. He to just, this day. he just, um, how did he figure out what kind of a person you were? Well, I think. Did I, he I, read these books? Or oh, I'm sure, I, I'm sure he read this one. And, uh, and. No, but was the, the best one. When, when was the movie made? The movie was made in 98. So, oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 the movie. David Frost was a very famous English um, producer of, he was first of all a news, uh, he produced television. He was a television comedy guy, and then he became a producer of movies and everything. Yeah. Era. So he, uh, so the movie, 98, 98 was when it was released, so um, nobody expected the movie to be made. But I think when you read the first chapter of the book, which is your book, yeah, my, your my book, book the, the, uh, and I, I don't even know what the title of it is, it's called The Watford Gap. And this was the one. from Watford, which is sort of like quoting Glam. <laughs> in Mexico, it's like in England we used to say nobody goes north of Watford. Yeah. Similarly, aquí fuera de cualquier clan todo es no sé qué. It's the same thing. Yeah. Okay, carry on. The, uh, the the first chapter of the book has no input from me, because when the publisher and this was the and and you'll understand this a little bit. The, Who's the publisher? The publish uh, the publisher was Little Brown. Um, you got paid for that book. Um, my, my lawyers got paid for that book. <laughs> I didn't get paid for the book. Were you in, tell me, were you in jail at the time when it was produced? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I was in Germany first. Let you me, wrote it in jail? In jail. So there was a ghostwriter called Edward Whitley. So the publishers, and, and you'll understand what this is, is they wanted to suggest that there was a class struggle. You know, it was working class boy from Watford against the big blue-blooded banking right. institutions. But I never felt that in my life. But that's what sells a book. So I the, fully agree. That's so the publishers point. enforced that first chapter on me. I want to talk about the culture towards the end of this thing because I think it's a big point. Because uh, I've actually read all the other books. Fine. Okay, so anyway, so you were in over your head. When did you realize that you had literally broken the bank? Um, on the day that you mentioned, the 24th, 25th of February. The 5th, 19th. The Friday. The, well, I, I fled. I fled on the Thursday. I ran away from Singapore on the 23rd of February, and then on the 24th. What, 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 what did you think? Did you think you you resigned? Did you think you just leave them with a the mess? You resigned, or were you actually worried you'd get put in jail or something? What, what did you think? I wasn't too concerned about me, but I had my wife with me, and I didn't want her to be arrested or put under any pressure in Singapore. Okay, it's a quasi police state. You know, there are very strict rules. You can't chew gum, right? You can't, you can't chew gum. But I didn't want my wife 
under any form of duress. So it was more important for me to make sure that she was safe. And for me, what that looked like was getting back to the UK or a Western country as quick as possible. Jurisdiction, but what did you think? I mean, but you only realized because there'll be all these people like Tony Hawes and all these Railton and all these people, yeah. Ron Baker, all these names, which I was just, it's funny, in the car coming down, it was very funny because I was reminding myself it's extraordinary because it was a very vivid experience. We were discussing it just sure. before. It's a bit like what were you doing when Kennedy was shot? If you worked at Bearings, it was a huge deal mm -hmm. because it was all over the papers. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but how come you only realized that you'd broken the bank then? Because you didn't know how much, how, what the value of these things was about 500 million at the time. Right? Yeah. It wasn't so much that. I knew I, I would have been able to tell you how much margin I had with me in Singapore. So that was the, the margin roughly equated to what the potential loss was going to be. But had I ever been told what the capital base of the bank was? No, I, I'd never you considered it. No, I never considered it. Never considered it. As long as the, somebody in Treasury was looking after You were 25 years old. Well, how old were you in 1994? When did you uh, in, uh, 28. So I was 28 at the time of the collapse of the bank. Who's counting, yeah. right? Oh, no, absolutely. So, but the, the, the capital, you know, the capital that need to, needed to be raised to come out to me in Singapore wasn't something that I was concerning myself with. I agree I should have, I should have been concerning myself with it and my ethical compass should have been wider and I should have been worried about what was, how it was going to affect people like yourself and other people who worked at Bearings, how it was going to affect shareholder value, all these sort of things. But I was very blinkered. This was trying to survive day by day. And, and you were a trader. Yeah, but it wasn't even that. This was more, it, it was more animal instinct. You know, I'm in a bad situation. It's getting worse. I need to, can I survive another day or another hour? And then eventually you start to think, well, I've got to, I've got a month to turn this around. And it's just about trying to get through that process and wait for that eureka moment when hopefully you get all the money back. But, but tell me, so you're arrested in Frankfurt on, I think, the Wednesday. So I actually flew to London that day. December. Was, I think it was, Sorry, um, it was the 1st or 2nd of March. March I'd say. Right, exactly. You're, you're, I, I mean, that was the day I actually flew to London. But we won't talk about it. But, so <laughs> Why don't you want to talk about feel? it? Um, Again, and I'm being entirely honest here, you, you, that, it's, that animal instinct takes over. You know, I'm, I'm now in pure survival mode. The, I've been arrested by the police. I'm in a little room in the back of Frankfurt prison. I've got no idea what's going to happen. In the back of the prison or the airport? Sorry, the back of the airport. <laughs> but I'm in the back of the airport. I'm in the back of the airport at first. But uh, my wife's still with me. She's been arrested. The Singaporean authorities or Singaporean police are coming to arrest to pick us up because they say we're traveling on false passports. Okay, we're not. We've got the same passports that we've had for the last five or six years. English passports. Five, five or six years. So then the Singaporeans changed the charges. My wife's allowed to, to leave. So you're dragged being... back to Singapore. No, no, no. The Germans wouldn't let them take us. So the Germans then the Germans let my wife go because the charge was dismissed, because she had a she had a her own passport, as did I. And then I was sent to a German prison to stay overnight, and then I was remanded and went in front of a judge. Um, a couple of German a couple of days later, Herxt. It wasn't called Colditz or something. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sure. I'm sure some people would have liked me to have gone to Colditz, <laughs> but um, no, it's called Auschwitz. But... <laughs> um, the uh, Herxt was the name of the prison. Uh, it was. Uh, it was a like meet... like the chemical company. Yeah, near Frankfurt. Yes. How long were you there? Very close. I was there for a total of eight and a half, nine months. So you learned German? Uh, prison German. It's not very polite. <laughs> you were nine months in, but meanwhile, you were, the charges were brought against you. Were. Uh, I, I, uh, what were they? Um, I, I, I faced 12 charges in total. So I think there was 12 charges of cheating, uh, which is the way that it's defined in the... Uh, in, in, in the Singapore legal environment. Um, cheating equates for me to false accounting. But do you think you deserved it? Absolutely. Five years? Uh, six and a half was the total. I spent, uh, you get a standard one-third remission. 
Um, so you I got spent, remission? Yeah, everybody does it. So how long were you in jail? Four years and four months. In Sing Sing, but you were nine months in Germany, Germany. and then how long in, it was Sing Sing? Uh, Singapore, yeah. In the Changi. Sing, a Changi jail. Which, which is, Changi is the one that they all think it was. It wasn't. I was, Changi is a, as you would know, is a very colonial old uh, prison. That's where they hang people in Singapore. That, yeah. So, um, so right next to Changi. The Japanese, it wasn't very savory. No, no. So the, um, and there were lots of prisoners of war who would have been in Changi. Exactly. So right next door to Changi, there's a, a new modern uh, high security prison called. Is that where you were? Yeah, called Tanamera. So, so it's you were cleaner. No, it, it's a tough regime. You sleep on the floor. The floor is very rough and uneven. You're locked up for 23 hours a day. There's, you don't get you get three books a month. That's all that you're allowed. Um, so you, you you are your own constant companion. So you're constantly thinking about you didn't things. Make that any friends? Friends. No, no. You get by. You 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 get by. And I, I suppose I you know sometimes it's like working in the city for me. You know you. And I, I'm not trying well, to be. The I'm city not, is like Changi Jail. No 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 no. But in terms of making friends. <laughs> I mean, not everybody in the city is your friend. You know, you're competing you against work. these people half the time as well. So, so when did you get out? Uh, I got out on the um, 3rd of July, 1999, so Independence Day um, in the US. I arrived back in the UK on the 4th of July, 1999. Now, so that time, to what extent did you realize the enormity, we'll call it, I mean, I get the point that you were very young and you, you made mistakes which turned into crimes, let's face it. Did you realize the enormity of having destroyed an institution of the history and the value of Barry's? No. You never. I think, no, I think the you only... Didn't, you didn't realize it even no. when you were in jail? No, because when you're in jail, and, and again, this is just being me honest with you, Tim, you're, you're, you, you are... Uh, I mean, you, you're secreted away on purpose, but you're, you, you don't know what is going on outside. So the rest of the world. No, yeah, so it's a very narrow existence. So as I was saying to you earlier, that, I mean, one of these, I can't tell you which of these books is the best other than mine, but um, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the guys that, was, uh, that I've met since is John Gapper. And what's he, what have you talked to him about? Well, well John is a, a Financial Times journalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's based in, I think John's based in New York now. He may have gone back to London. I'm not entirely sure. But John, um, I, I did a radio program with John, with Peter Norris. Um, we together? Yeah. Um, Peter Norris I knew quite well. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, and there was a lady there. Who was the lady who recently went for the Tory, uh, head of the Tory party? The one who lost out. Oh, I forgot. She used to work for BZW. Yeah, I know you mean the the, uh, the environment minister or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure what she. But she was she was on the Treasury Select Committee uh, at, at the time. Um, I should remember her name. What did you discuss at that in that? Uh, well, I, I, I just I mean we discussed lots of things, and um, I can't remember who it was. One of the big Radio Four, um, one of the Radio Four interviewers who was. Uh, leading the program but obviously it was a tough one for me meeting Peter for the first time after all this period and you know the thing that really came across for me and this is probably where it really hit home how damaging it was both for I, I understand you know over a period we've worked out or I've worked out how damaging it was for the organization but this, this program uh, it's called uh, the program when was it? Oh, it's about four or five years ago now and it's called oh, okay it's called The Reunion. So it's a Radio 4 program. And uh, so Peter is on it. John Gapper was on it from the phone from New York. There's another guy there who apparently worked for Bearings, but I never knew him. Uh, and you don't then remember his name? The, no, the late... Oh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, I think the name was. The surname was Edwards. Uh, there was the lady who worked for BZW, who's now uh, a, a, an MP. And I'll remember... As soon as we finish, we'll probably remember her name. Yeah. And then... Um, but the thing that really came across, like John Gapper was all over this. He was the investigative journalist for the Insight team at the Financial Times. So he spent an awful lot of time with Peter Norris, you know, asking Peter questions. 
So uh, whilst I was cocooned in prison and not having to face anything, the embarrassment, the trouble that was going on, Peter had to face that all. And the stories that came across, genuine stories between himself and John, you know, that really brought home to me how damaging it was for Peter as a person. Now, thankfully, it was only for a short period of time. You know, he recovered. He's, I don't know if you know, but he's the non-executive chairman of Richard Branson's companies, or he was at the time. And he was working with Richard Branson. Which is, I don't know what happened to Andrew Tucky. He was the president. He set up another bank. He set up another bank. Mm. Or a fund. Um, right. Again, that was years ago. I don't know right now. Um, there was another guy, I don't know if you, you remember him, uh, he was Japanese uh, warrants he used to trade. His name was Trevor Slaversky. Uh, Trevor, was, Trevor and Warren Premack were the two guys who made an awful lot of money trading Japanese warrants when they were in, the, in, in their infancy. But do you realise, I mean, do, do you feel any sense of, of guilt? Or? Absolutely. The guilt, embarrassment, remorse. You know, there's nobody who wishes that it didn't happen more than me, but I can't turn the clock back. So you get yourself into this situation where, you know, you, you're still alive, right? So it might have been easier to die. Right, so what than... you okay, right. No, so, we, so we've gone to the first point, which is all around what happened then. And uh, the next question I'd already asked before we, we decided to have this conversation was whether you'd read these books, which I, ha I think I've read all of them, but, um, and I've more or less absorbed them. And... Um, so you well, can't tell me which is the good one. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go through them and tell you the truth. And I'll, I'll speak to you about this one as well. And, I, and, I, and I'll tell you a piece of information. I've read this one. I have. I read it in prison. And it, because my lawyer asked me to go through it. And, okay, that's and, important. This is the, the official government investigation into the, um, into the event, which is unbelievably clearly and well written. I have only... Because the bits I knew about, which is the way it was struck, it's, it, it's a, to me, I, I literally I read it for the first time in the last 10 years as I drove to this. Let me, this. Let me, let me explain this one first to you then. The, and, and, and these are genuine facts, right? The, this was issued in July 1995. The Singaporean inspectors issued their report in uh, about September 1995. When I came back from Singapore in 1999, my first couple of meetings were with the liquidators, Ernst and Young. Okay, and the first day that I arrived there, they, uh, somebody came in with a delivery of 500 boxes of documents. About your, your about everything. It, everything arrived back from Singapore, so there were so even some of my personal possessions in these boxes. And what the liquidators said to me is that the English authorities and the Singaporean authorities did not share documentation, documentation until I returned to the UK. So this, this report is issued just looking at things that happened in London. Yeah. And the Singaporeans issued one based on the stuff that they had in Singapore. So neither of them can be complete because they didn't look at the whole. So there are, there are a lot of glaring, now I, I very painstaking, I had nothing else to do, admittedly in prison in Germany, but I very painstakingly went through and highlighted it. This is the first time I've seen it since 1995. I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, you must be the only person who has a copy. I, I've never seen one since, but the one... I, I became, I had, a, I had a year to sure. decompress from the whole thing. There, I mean, there, there are things in here, I mean, Towards the end, and I won't be able to find it for you yeah. now because it was that there's there's a part in here that says that they believe I have assets in South Africa. I've never been to South Africa, so there was a load of stuff here that was just taken. There are there are people in here who said that they spoke to me and they give accounts of of meetings that we had. I never met them, but so they were some it's actually wrong. It's cover up. A lot of it is cover up, believe it. I'd love cover up of if you could, by what? Just people trying to show that they were doing their job. I, it Are you wasn't mean within the back. Yeah, it wasn't malicious. It wasn't okay. malicious in any way. It's just CYA. Ab so. Absolutely. CYA and important compliance concept. Absolutely. That's what they were doing. Okay, right. So I, I mean if you want if you want to leave me the copy, I'll go through and highlight it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so you're you're saying the only account but I, I'd say times. this one's probably the best because John was, this book, Judith used to, I, I don't know Stephen Faye's background, but Judith 
used to work for Bearings. She was in Hong Kong at the time. This book came out really, really quickly. It's a pure commercial right. exercise. She didn't know me. She was the first. Yeah. She was the first. Um, John was on the Insight team at the Financial Times with another guy called Mario Franchetti. Right. And that it, it, this was their baby for a year. So you think that, that's a useful... Because so I'm saying I, I looked at the ball and I became like... I mean, the movie you think... I think mine's the best. But okay, but what about the movie? Uh, the movie is... Uh, you know, it was a commercial. It's all up, uh, I think it's on Netflix. I, it's free. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can. I, I you can download it so, from the um, YouTube or something. But Rogue Trader, but it's very the cover. Yeah. So I actually, I show it to my employees as a as a lesson to my employees. Carry on. Yeah, I, I, and I think there are good lessons from it. Um, the uh, the movie was made by Sir David, as we said. James Dearden produced it. I watched it yesterday for the first time for 12 years with the risk mathematics students and or some of the risk mathematics students and uh, you know you don't know whether to laugh, cry, hide away. Um, I, 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 don't, like, I, I remember what happened, I remember the bits that are wrong within the movie, it oversimplifies certain things. I, I didn't used to swear as much as you and Gregor did, I don't think, but um, I just, I, just I would, don't remember. No, I was quite introverted. I uh, I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have been very outgoing. I kept myself as to you myself. And Gregor. Yeah, he, he, again, it's that Barrow boy. What about the wife? Um, I can't speak for her, but I don't think. I mean, if you want an honest answer, I don't think we used to have sex as often as you and McGregor did in the movie. But <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but. Just again, it goes back to that working class boy versus blue blooded British bank, Barra boy fighting the system. I never felt that, but that's what you know, that's the way it could have been subconscious. You just don't know. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. I genuinely, I used to enjoy it every day. And I, I worked for Coots before, Coots was a great place to work, Bearings was a great place to work. You know that yourself. Yeah, Bearings was a great place to work, but okay, now. It didn't have we'll great controls, but it was a nice place to work. Right, but going on to the financial, the, 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 then the, the aspects of the financial system, we know that you know, the bank wasn't saved, that it wasn't systematically, but what do you think are the lessons for finance and for financing? Lessons for finance and financiers? Well, I think this whole episode, well, if you thinking of modern generations, because none of them have not even heard of this episode. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously it was 22 years ago now. Um, I think from that point forward, the whole governance arena has improved significantly. You know, it can still improve, I think, going forward. There are things that you can look to do, but the um, but that whole area of governance... The governance way and or compliance, it's not the compliance, same Compliance, risk management, all of them have improved. I mean, at Bearings at the time, there was one risk manager, just one. There was one lady who worked in HR, she was based in London, okay, and she was also the financial accountant, I think, as well. What was her name? I can't remember, Liz was her first name. Uh, I can't remember her surname, and, that, and again, the compliance people, there, there were very, very few of them. So now, you have pre-trade compliance, you have it. Now, a lot of people will complain that it's a business blocker rather than a business enhancer, but that's up to the business to integrate that correctly to make sure you want to be safe. Do you think it's time. a result of the bearing? There were a whole set of it, you I know, the Lynch thing, the Orange County. Yeah. There are a whole series of blow-ups, but yeah. the one in Société Générale. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm saying you were unique because just, again, anybody who would ever um, listen to us, um, it's kind of a unique thing that one guy destroys a 232-year institution. Yeah, it's like his story. Yeah, but I'll tell you what I think, and I want your view on this. But the kind of I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah, and my own view is that the company had been built up by Christopher Heath. I was hired by him the same way you, and what I learned from him was that he. I actually met him in Los Angeles when he hired me to run. He said, "Look, I, I spend half my time." with clients and the other half of my employees. That's what he did. I saw him twice a year in Mexico. Yeah. And he was then removed by Bearings for whatever reason in 1993. 
Yeah, and Peter Norris was an introverted corporate finance guy. How much time did you spend with him? Uh, I think I met him once. This is my point, but I'm, my general view is that if Christopher Heath had interviewed you, he would have figured out what you were doing. Do you agree with me or not? No, I do. I do. I mean, Christopher was a very powerful figurehead within the organization. I no, think but he had this sense of yeah, people. He did. he did. And it is people. You look at you look at why any financial scandal has evolved over the over the years. It's down to people and processes uh, and, and controls within those environments. Um, but people's the huge part. I mean, you know, the regulators around the world are now looking at this subject of conduct risk. It's only, it's only a word that's been... What is subject? This is a new word. What is that? Well, conduct risk. Just conduct. So people's conduct. But, right, like ethical. Yeah, but it, that was the same 20 years ago, 30 years, but they just never gave it a title. You know, and now regulators are, are, are looking at this, so it's all about conduct and how, how that... Uh, like the mooning. Uh, well, that, that's a part. You know, like if, if, that incident, if that incident was reported, I mean, this, again, this is a story that I spoke about yesterday, but Barron's paid $50,000 to get me off of that charge. You know, so this was a significant event that lots of people, you know, knew about. And, you know, if it was catalogued correctly, and obviously, you know, just from a behavioral perspective, you know, it raises you concerns. Could have been fired. Going about getting fired. No, there was no chance of it because they, all they were focusing on was the profit. But my general point is that cultural point is not made in any of the books because I'm really no. the point I'm making is that I happen to study ancient history in a, at Oxford. When you piece together centuries and all this kind of stuff, here we have contemporary history. Yeah, something where everybody's alive, and I, my view is that none of them got the point which I've just made. Yeah, but it's about. Man, running a company, this is relevant, I think, for the people who might be. It's in the end, it's a person to person thing. You've got to understand the motivations and, the, as you say, the conduct. And in the end, it boils down to that. And that's what was lost when Christopher went. Yeah. I mean, now, he may have had his problems with the company. But sure. Do you agree with me? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, the world of banking is about knowing your customer. That's, that's one of the guidelines that you have for your. Compliance, your risk management. Right, your credit free. means trust. Okay, credit well, means I believe. Yeah, but what, what, you know, from a banking perspective, in terms of how they look after their people, they should know their people. And you their know, customers. And, and that's what it's about. And, you know, unfortunately, like you say, with, with Christopher being removed from the situation, that was, you know, that was lost at that particular point. That's my view. I think there's another, there's a, there's a thing that I'd like you to think about, but the, um, the, um, and, and, and these, these sort of, this comment comes out of a series of meetings and conversations with different people. There was also a book written recently, or a couple of years ago, by a guy, uh, by a Dutch journalist. And it's called Swimming with Sharks. And so he, uh, his name is, his name is Joris Lewendijk, and he, um, he used to work for the Telegraph, I think. And then post global financial collapse, he was asked to interview people from the city and see what was going wrong, and so he talked to traders, compliance staff, risk managers, board members, and whatever else, just to see what had changed within within the environment and uh, you know what, what else was happening within big banking at that particular time. And he drew a lot of conclusions that were fairly similar to the ones that existed during Barron's at the time. And so the, the analogy was that not a great deal had changed. But I started in the world of banking in 1987, which was the Big Bang era, deregulation, Maggie Thatcher standing up at, uh, at Mansion House and talking about this new breed of people that are coming into the city of London and how it's flourishing and doing so well. Gordon Brown did a similar speech just before the global financial collapse as well, about how things were so great in the city of London. Um, but one of the things that came across from the book, again, and you'd know this period even better than me, both Joris, be before, and, yeah, before and after, you know, before that, a lot of the uh, organizations that, or firms that worked in the city were partnerships and you were all involved. Everybody knew everything. Absolutely. And your word was your bond. But then there was this deregulation and there were lots of big banks and now banks were owned by shareholders, stakeholders and it was other people's money. And I just think, and, and, and like I, I don't know, right, but the, the, the position I'd like to put is that was where it changed and where culture and conduct really changed when 
when there was deregulation in 1987 and nobody really had control of it. And the conduct now, I think it's very difficult to put that conduct back into line. It's, you know, there's been a, a, a seismic shift and you know, it, it's very difficult to put it back. But hopefully with new generations of people coming through the city, it's possible. But you know, in all of the discussions I've had with different people, that kind of hits the mark for me in terms of when that conduct really, really changed. You know, you've, you've gone from your, um, from some of the firms that you work from, from your Rothschilds and everybody that were... They still exist. Yeah, yeah Rothschilds absolutely. Rothschilds were the few companies left. Uh, but do you have anything else you'd like to add which I haven't asked you about? Which... No, I think, I, I think we've... I'd, I'd love to uh, extend the conversation at some point, you know, if we, if we had more time to, to talk about things and, and look at some of the episodes within it. Uh, you know, I, I always view it as, um, you know, as much as I hate that episode and it was embarrassing, it's a, a thing that I'd love to forget, I'm not able to forget it. So well, Embarrassing seems to be a bit of a light, light word, with all light? the difference. Um, I don't know, for Instead me... Sort of shameful or something oh, like abso Absolutely, I, uh, yeah, look, all of them. There, there, there's a whole gamut of descriptions that you can, you can bring to it. It's, um, but you've got a choice. You can run away from it or you can confront it and my style is that if I'm going to move forward and I'm going to live a life um, you know not necessarily the one that I'm going to be proud of I'm gonna I'm gonna face it rather than run away from it so given the opportunity to speak to Peter Norris I wanted to make very clear that I apologized unreservedly to Peter I can't undo it I apologize to you in terms of any impact that it had on your life or your, or your organization at the time but I still can't undo it so you know and I'm also a very firm believer Tim that you know everybody's entitled to their opinion I have an opinion I'll defend my opinion I'll defend myself but I'm also realistic and rational and I know I did wrong um, I, uh, nobody wishes I, it hadn't happened more than me uh, but unfortunately I can't undo time and uh, nobody can Thank you very much. Thank you. Audio Jungle.